Please be seated as we prepare our hearts to receive the message from his word today. The message today on God's word is on searching the scriptures. Do you search them? Ask yourself, do you search them? I encourage you to search them from Genesis to Revelation. There are some books that are harder than others. There are some promises that are harder to lay hold to than others. But from the earliest to the latest, the longest to the shortest, the easiest to the hardest, search the scriptures. Some are rarely quoted and not very well known. Search the history the geography, the chronology, the miracles, the truths, the mysteries, the precepts, the promises, and the warnings. And in doing so, you will get to know your creator by name. Don't pass over a single passage. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book not only allows us to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it shows us the way to live each and every day. When we lose the grasp on this, we become susceptible to all kinds of temptations, weaknesses, and deceptions. I want to just let you know my next series beginning next week is Knowing the Devil's Name. We're approaching the time of year which has become quite a lucrative venture, the celebration of Halloween, where people decorate their homes sometimes more elaborately than they do for Christmas where devils are made fun of or exalted. What do the scriptures teach about the devil? What do they teach about demons, the demonic powers today in this world? That's what we're going to be exploring in God's word together. In relation to today's message of searching the scriptures, just this last week I heard the devil's voice twice distinctively. Once through an individual and second, through the leaders of a denomination. And I want to share you how. As a pastor, I confess, I get weary of hearing God's word twisted. People invoke the name of Jesus, speak the things that he may have spoken. Very specifically, they know the words word for word, and they misuse them in such a way as to lead people astray. I heard someone this week say these two sayings together, judge not lest ye be judged, and let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Now both of those uh, quotes of Jesus were used in the context of identifying sin in another person. Now these verses are frequently used to condone sinful behavior or to criticize those who speak out against sin. Often these people quote our Savior, but they don't know the Savior and they don't respect the Savior. In fact, in the speaking, in the way that they intend them, they are literally the voice of demons. They know the verses by heart because they've heard other godless people use them the same way. They pose as those who revere Jesus. But the Savior did not teach these things so that we as Christians will not speak out against immorality. Amen? If you follow to the end of each of those teachings, you find that in judging another person, it is so that you don't fail to judge yourself. First, take the speck out of your own eye before the plank out of your own eye before the speck of your brother's doesn't mean that not to identify truth or to help a brother or sister who is letting it stray. In the same way, the casting of the stones, the context of that is the woman that is caught in adultery. Does Jesus say that that's not adultery and we shouldn't call that out as a sin? No. Instead, he says, 
Neither do I condemn you. As the judge, he has the ability to condemn, and he says, go and sin no more. He identifies it as sin, and it calls the person to not return to it. So that's one example of how the devil twists God's word and uses it for his purposes. And if the devil, we know, does this often, we'll, study, we'll reveal this in the series, how important it is, is it for you and I to search the scriptures and know what Jesus actually meant when he said these things and so many others? The second time was leaders in the denomination. I attended a, a classes meeting for the Reformed Church in America earlier this week. And there we studied a prepared Bible study by the General Synod. And it was several pages long with a myriad of scriptures piled one on top of another dealing with church unity. And the issue that is being dealt with in the RCA is, is how to deal with homosexuality and leadership. Ordained homosexuals, ordained elders, leading churches, which is going rampant in the RCA without any church discipline. So the page after page after page of study took verses about unity and verses about covenant and the question was asked, what does covenant look like? Yet not a single verse in the study dealt with the issue of homosexuality not even once. Not whether it was sinful. Not whether it should be rebuked. There were no texts concerning pastors called to be pure in life and in doctrine as were instructed in God's word. None. Over and over and over, the scriptures were manipulated to say, unity, 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 we must have unity. Nobody leave. And my stomach was stirred, as were many others, because of the manipulation and wrong use of the scriptures. Now, how do we know if they're wrong? How do we know unless we ourselves search the scriptures? Peter pointed out that twisting the scriptures is a grievous error which leads to destruction. In 2 Peter 3.16, he writes, he's speaking of Paul in Paul's writings. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Have you ever read Paul? Paul is not the simplest of teachers. Sometimes I hear people that say that a teacher is no good and that they don't like the teacher simply because his teachings are hard. If you've ever studied the book of Romans, it takes a while to, to mine the truth from those verses. They're steeped with big words, theology and stuff that are, it takes a while to say, now what did he say? And you read it over again, you break it down, you look up that word and you go, oh, that's what he meant. As, as Peter continues, he said, he, Paul writes some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. If we don't know all the scriptures, if we don't know what Peter says, then we don't take this warning and we can be easily led astray. He continues in verse 17, therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, by studying the scriptures, we grow. This series about being rooted, the more you grow, the more your roots go down. The more your roots you go down, the more that you grow. And the mental picture here is the, the vine that, that grows deep, it's trimmed back and it yields abundant fruit. Another biblical picture is of the tree that is planted by the river of life that yields fruit in all of its season. It is, it's like an oak that cannot be blown over easily by the wind. That's supposed to be a picture of you and me. So many times you've heard sermons about the importance of reading the scripture. Yet, many of us don't give much time to it or dedication to it. Usually you can tell what someone's interested in by the kind of investment that they make. 
Ask yourselves this. What is your movie collection? How many? What is your Christian education section at home? Do you want a commentary? Do you give attention to them? We stack up these resources for our entertainment, but we do, do we do so for God's word? I just ask you that in a matter of conviction that we search the scriptures. You don't get to know this book haphazardly. It takes work and discipline. So I want to give you some practical ways to search the scriptures. And I'm just going to number them and give the scriptural reason for it. First, plan to read them and follow the plan. Sometimes we don't read God's word just because we don't plan on it. Jesus got up early in the morning, went out into the wilderness to pray. He planned to pray. That's how he got up early. How many of you plan on eating today? Only half of you plan on eating today? I know that's not true. Some of you plan on eating even though you didn't make the meal. Some of you made a plan to take in the word of God even though it was prepared by someone else to give it to you today. Amen? But you're here to eat and I commend you for it. For Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If we're not feeding ourselves with God's word, our soul starves. And a starving soul isn't much good to God. It's not exercised or worked out with no strength. So if you plan to eat in a day, then you go about eating. And if you plan to spend some time in God's word, then you plan on searching the scriptures. Follow a regular plan in reading them so that you can get acquainted with the whole of it. There are so many different ways to do this. How many of you have read like through the Bible, read through the Bible in a year or two or three? Raise your hand real high. Okay, so that's one way, a through the Bible. It gets you a kind of a scope of the whole. If you edu- want to educate your children in the things of the whole, for example, the one that meets in this classroom led by Chris, Route 66. It's a curriculum designed to take you through all the books, teaching some, some nuggets and powerful elements of each book so they get the full landscape. So we train up our children in a way so that they know the whole counsel of God. And make this reading whether it be studying a book at a particular time, studying something that you're compelled to because your daily circumstance, you have a question that needs to be answered, part of your private devotion to God. Not that you should confine yourselves to a set plan once and forever. Sometimes you put yourself to a plan and after a while it gets a little bit dull. What would happen if you ate pizza every, well, I should probably shouldn't use pizza. Yes, not good. Green beans, every day. You might want to vary that a little bit, you see. So sometimes we grow stale even in our disciplines and then we crack the door open to not fully engage God in his word because we've allowed it to become dull in our ears. After all, we don't read God's word under compulsion like, okay, I must do this like going to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned. This is a meal where we go to get to know our God. Some parts of the Bible are difficult. And some of it, frankly, is like a desert. It's a bit dry. You read certain parts and you come to a genealogy and it's like, do I really want to stumble through all these names? All right, be honest, you've been there, right? You, you get reading the law and the law and the law and the, it's like, oh man. Whew. You know, you want to turn the page. So there, in those texts, it's good to have a word alongside like a commentary or a help to help you digest what is there because it's hard for you to see it. And in the process, you learn to see things that you couldn't see before. Next, mark up your Bible. This is God's word, and this is God's word for you. This is God's word, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, so that it will transform you. 
Not so that it can be reverenced from afar, but reverenced from within. Okay, how do you mark things? You can put notes in the margins. I know some of you remind me if I preached a text twice because you made a note the last time I preached it. Sometimes the Lord gives you an insight from a circumstance because you are walking through a particular time. I remember recently someone giving testimony of how Psalm 69, 1, help me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck, and how that verse was meaningful in their life. Put a note. Remember that time when the waters came up to your neck. And maybe, just maybe, that'll reinforce in your memory to use that word to encourage another brother or sister when you see the waters rising. Use the note pages in the back for passages which you find most helpful in life. You have a certain condition. You have certain temptations that you're weak to. Or there's a specific text that has just moved your heart and you might want to revisit that one. Make a note in the back. You know, do, sometimes there's note sections. It's wide open pages. And you hear a very good teaching on a particular thing in text. Make some, make some notes there so you can refer to them again. Or who knows that someday when you die, and this book which you love is passed to your children or grandchild and they open the back and they see a text that you love and they open it and they might come to know Jesus as their Savior as a result. Are you prone to anger? Depression? Feel alone in the world? Then often review God's word on these things so that you can be strengthened unto it. Instead of quoting the Bible, I'll quote Einstein. What is it called when a person does the same thing over and over, not expecting the same result? Ignorance? Insanity. insanity. It's insane. Why would we, you, I, brother and sister in the Lord, fall on our face over and over and over again and not heed the wise advice and instruction from our creator, that shows us exactly how to avoid that particular pitfall. How foolish that is. First John 4.4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You've got a certain temptation, claim authority in the Lord Jesus Christ who is in you to overcome. God's word is powerful when it's spoken. Did not the Lord Jesus Christ himself defend himself against the devil using the word of God? So mark up your Bible. Have a plan. Next, compare one scripture with another and the more obscure texts with the more plain. Not all scriptures are easy. Some of them are downright confusing and yet you compare back and forth. Use the plain ones to interpret the difficult ones. Use cross-referencing. If you have any Bible that, is, that costs you a little bit more than just the plain pew Bible, you'll have cross-references in it. Those are the words that are along the sides or down in the bottom or in the middle of the page of a study Bible that show other texts that deal with this same thing. If you're diligent, one of my favorite kinds of Bibles is a Thompson chain reference Bible. It's got a chain reference to subjects. So if there's a subject that's referenced in your reading, you look to the side and it'll, it'll list the subject and then it will tell you the next text in the Bible that deals with that same thing. It's beautiful. It's a chain reference. Very easily you study text after text after text that deal with that particular subject. It's It's awesome. Another one of my favorite Bibles is my current preaching Bible, which is the Wide Margin Bible. Wide margins are nice for making notes, and I make lots of them. So it's one of my favorites. Some of you have a study Bible. It's basically, study Bibles are helpful because study Bibles have a commentary on the bottom. And let me share with you how these get compiled. 
When many theologians agree on how to interpret a certain text, then that consensus is put in the study notes down below so that the average person can understand what good sound theologians understand that text to mean. But difficult texts where theologians can't agree and you read a difficult text and you want to read what that means, nothing. Not there. Then you have to go outside of a study Bible to a commentary or a pastor or a theologian that has done some work on that thing that they might be able to help you. Every once in a while, I, I ask for help with Dr. Kaiser Jr., who is a friend of mine and lives nearby, especially if it's an Old Testament question. I love to mine his mind in his understanding of Hebrew so I welcome questions when you have them about the complexity of a particular text. It means that you're studying the scriptures, you're searching the scriptures, and it is my joy to come alongside and help where I can. Or if not, if I don't know the answer, then I'll study it and try to find it. So some of you have life application Bibles. They're especially good to learn how to apply God's word in the daily, and it helps us to train our mind to always go to application. God doesn't intend us just to get smarter about knowing God's word. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law knew God's word very, very well, didn't they? But he says to them, yet you know not the scriptures. Know not is you didn't apply them right. The Bereans in Acts chapter 10, 17 10 through 15 are a group of people, they lived in Berea. That's why they're called Bereans. They happen to live there. It's like some people who live in Oostburg, you're like Oostburgers. So you're a combination between a burger and a brat. Bereans lived in Berea. They were Jews, it says, of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. What made them more noble? It wasn't their blood. What made them more noble is that they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Do not listen to what a pastor says and take it for truth without authentication of the scriptures. One of the ways that the devil can enter the church is the pulpit. I'll cover that in following weeks. So don't be led astray. Check them yourself. Know them. In verse 12 of Acts 17, as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and Greek men. So the ones that he's talking about, the noble ones, they were the noble Jews. The noble Jews studied and tested. When they said Moses foretold about Jesus, they looked it up. Oh, what does it say in Deuteronomy chapter 18? Oh, it says one that will be promised. That's the one? Like Moses? How many people like Moses have lived on the earth? How many can say for water to move and it moves or be still and it's still? And they read that text, the Brians, and they go, Jesus is doing this. Jesus has done this, I believe. But how many Jews are there in this world that believe that the word of God in the Old Testament is the word of God, but they have no understanding of it? Many. So compare one scripture to another in our searching the scriptures. Read with holy attention. How many of you have served in the military? Raise your hand real high. When you're told to stand at attention, how do you stand? At attention. Why? Because one person is authority over you. How much more for the holy God who is in heaven, who has given us his word for us to obey? So read with holy attention like a soldier in the presence of a four-star general. Like a servant in the presence of a king like a steward of a powerful ruler. Listen to this question. Listen to this question. Will we not be held in account for what God has told us? 
if God has told us and we did not give enough attention to give an ear to what he said, do you not think we will answer for it? God has given us this book. Ignorance is no excuse. I've known believers that, that don't want to study God's word because they don't, know what, they don't even want to know what God has to say about it so they can go on living the way they want to live. And this, because God is like a four-star general and a king does not mean that we can't be friends with our Lord. We can. Did not Jesus tell us that we can reference God as daddy? When you pray, call him Abba. You can have gentle conversations with your commander when you know him. What kind of attention? First, to the words. Pay attention to the words. It doesn't make any sense to read God's word without paying attention to the words. They're his. Second, to their meaning. What do they mean? And third, their divine authority. If God says it, God means it for us. What is the meaning? When God calls us in his word to confess our sins because he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, what does that mean? He means he wants us to acknowledge our sinfulness so that we can receive forgiveness, so that we can be set apart, holy, useful to him. If I set my mind against God and I just do what I want whenever I want, however long I want to do it, I'm living in a state of no forgiveness. This is what the women's Bible study is studying on Wednesday morning. They meet this week at 9 o'clock here at the church. Many of us know what God's word says Forgive about forgiveness, both forgiveness towards someone else and forgiveness from God. Yet how many times do we fail to exercise that truth? Which leads me to my next teaching in this. Beware of a worldly, fleshly, Mind. What I mean is this. When you have a worldly mind, your heart is in favor of your sin. And when your heart is in favor of your sin, it's sort of like an eclipse where the moon passes between the sun and the earth and the, the light doesn't get to the earth. Remember this happened recently across the United States and it left darkness? When our sin is between us and God, our hearts are not illumined. Because I've told God, I don't want to listen to you. I don't care what you're saying. I'm not interested. I want to do what I want. So beware of that mindset that keeps unrepentant sin in your heart. Because what happens is your ears get dulled to God's voice. You just stop hearing it. So really listen. And, and with this, work at being a disciple. The command of God is to make disciples. That's my call as a pastor is to make you disciples. Don't be afraid to claim to be a disciple of Jesus. Sometimes people are afraid to say that because that means that people would see you as a Christian and that might put you under a little pressure. It should. Work at it. A disciple is one that is disciplined towards godliness. Think about that and memorize it in your mind. A disciple is one that is disciplined toward godliness. We call that being like Jesus. Now when you are disciplined towards godliness, then you're aware of your surroundings. 
You're observant to your circumstances. Earlier, we had read Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The light lights up the places that I'm going to trip. And I'm aware of it because the light is shining on it. You're paying attention to your life around you. This is real stuff. You're carrying the light and you come into the presence of someone who corrupts your morality. And you know that God's word says that bad company corrupts good morals. You want to be a good moral person according to the rules that God has set and you're around bad company, the light of God's word shines and says, don't be hanging out with that person, otherwise your morality is going to go their direction. Amen? So when we are disciplined towards godliness, then our life is not aimless. We're not just wandering around haphazardly hearing a word from God from time to time. We are carrying his word in us so that we know where to step, what to say, how to respond, how to act, how to discern, and how to glorify God. It changes us. Paul says that we are running, winning, running a race as a Christian. And yet, many Christians are sitting on a couch watching other people run a race. The scriptures tell us that we're fighting a battle. And yet, many Christians are completely unarmed, going to battle against the powers and principalities on this earth that rule this place with no weapon of defense, no weapon of offense, and no armor. Ought we be surprised that they're sitting ducks? We're, God's word describes the body of Christ as the body of Christ. To some, he has given one task, to another, another, so that you can all work together. Some are deceived to think that they can live the Christian life without the church. That is an error and that is a lie from the devil. The illustration that Paul gives is that Christ is the head. Let's say one is a hand and different parts of the body that work in coordination. We can do great things together by myself. What am I going to do? Not much. The disciplined attitude helps mightily to understand the scriptures. Because when you come to the scriptures and you're disciplined towards godliness, you are open for the transformation to happen. When you come to God's word in a routine to learn something. Oh, I learned something today. That was good. That was a good, good sermon, pastor. I learned something today. Well, let me tell you, your life will tell me whether you learned something today. Amen? This last week, Wednesday night, I was flying high. We had a prayer gathering here in the fellowship, and it was sponsored by the young people. And if you walk into the fellowship area afterwards to enjoy the food someone has prepared for you, you'll see on the board a board of prayer requests and, and boards and sheets that help people pray for different things. And the, the greatest blessing that I had was from a couple different things from the young people. Um, one, the, uh, one of the young women that is serving in the nursery this morning gloried in the fact that she had a responsibility in the church. She took charge of a particular prayer station. It was her job to give instruction of what that prayer station was for. And she said, this is the first time that I've done anything for God other than babysit. That's empowering. And she was excited to serve God. And at the end, we as young people gathered hand in hand and prayed a prayer of intercession for all the prayer requests that were offered. And I heard young people boldly praying for the congregation's requests. One after another after another. I've sat with adults who claim to be Christians who, for years and years and years in their old age and they're afraid to speak a word of prayer in front of someone else for fear that they'd say the wrong word or whatever reason. Yet they were boldly interceding the prayer requests of the people of God, the young people. 
that excites me. I pray it excites you too. Another thing to do, humbly seek and yearn for his spirit to aid you. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Another interpretation of this, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. If you want to understand the spiritual truth, you need to have the Holy Spirit inspire you. Simple words to pray before you study God's word and while you study God's word and after you study God's word is Holy Spirit, illumine my heart. Help me to understand this. Help me to put it into practice. Help me to share this with others. Help me to apply this in my life today. And the word of God will come alive to you. And if you don't listen to any others, hear this this day. James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Whew, working up a sweat here. Be doers. When we're growing up and we're little and our mother or father gives us an instruction and we fail to carry it out, they ask, did you hear me? And they nod their head, uh huh. It's like, uh, did I ask you to mow the lawn before I came home from work? Did you hear me? Yeah. Then why isn't the lawn mowed? Right? So when we hear God's word, don't be just hearers of God's word. God's word says this, says that, says that, and you go your own way. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. You deceive yourself. It's a lie to yourself to hear God's word and not do it. What good is it if we don't do it? How many of you have heard that the church is full of hypocrites? Raise your hand real high. Welcome to the club. This is harder to do than it is to say. God's word challenges us to change. Challenges us to give up things that we love. To sacrifice. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. The cross was Jesus' sacrifice. Selfless. We're by nature selfish. It's hard to obey God's word. But if we don't, what good is it? It leads to a rich, filled life as God intends. I, I wish people understood this. It leads to a rich life. After, after walking with God for a period of time, when a word that is spoken through an unsanctified person to attack or discourage you and you are you are strengthened with the shield of faith from God's word. It just bounces off. It doesn't ruin your day. Someone mocks what you say because you repeat the words of God and rather than being discouraged, you consider it pure joy because great is the reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets of old. It changes your life. You live powerful in a joy-filled life. You're not dragged down with every word. You go through physical pain and you know that that pain is temporary and you know it's expected. Because you understand the doctrine of sin and death from the flesh. You go through life victorious instead of losing battle after battle after battle. So in closing... That's, that's the key that people usually key in on in closing. I'm getting close to the end. I'm getting hungry. Whatever you learn from the word, put it to work. Put it to work. Work to put it into practice. When you read a text where Jesus sends out the disciples to give testimony to others about him, pray that that specific day that you will have the opportunity to do the same.
The Lord teaches with the lesson on the good steward that who, he who has been given much, more will be given. See, the worldly way says uh, that's not very fair if you already have a lot that God would give you more. This is how it works. God gives you his truth. You exercise it, put it into practice, and he'll reveal more to you. Would you, think of this, would you give someone a million dollars after a week ago you gave them a million and they squandered it away at a gambling casino? Not a trick question, right? If God has given you the glories of the mysteries of himself and you've treated them no better than leftovers in the trash can on a Sunday afternoon. Why would he give you more? Faithful practice of God's word provides communion with our creator. It opens up streams of living water that refreshes us and gives us life. While a person who doesn't put God's word into practice is like a damned stream with no outlet that grows stagnant and stale. In John chapter five, beginning at verse 39, the Lord Jesus said this to those that would test him. You study the, dil the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you will have eternal life. Is that right or not? Absolutely it is. These are the very scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now these were Sadducees, a, a, a denomination of Jews. So in modern day, if you're driving along and they had Jewish denominations, you'd be, see the Sadducee church and see the Pharisee church, you know, just like you see the, the CRC, the RCA, the Presbyterians, the UCC. There are different denominations back then too based on their doctrine. And the doctrine of the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And they came to ask him, so uh, when you're resurrected and you're in heaven, so they were just messing with him. They didn't even believe this stuff. Um, if you marry one, more than one wife, which one's your wife in heaven? And Jesus says to them, you don't know because you do not search the scriptures. He says, I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept him. You'll go listen to a, a teacher of the law that has a degree from such and such a seminary and you'll place a bunch of weight on that, but you don't even listen to the Son of God. Verse 44. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? But do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So these are the people that were, they were very, they were very legalistic. They, they followed the letter of the law. And he says to them, you make much about this law, but if you actually read it, it points to me. And this is the example of sometimes where we get religious in our activities, but our heart is far from God. And in that case, you can search the scriptures, memorize it to the end, and it will do you absolutely no good. Let the streams of living water refresh and wash, and the Lord will transform. But when we stubbornly say, I don't want to do what you asked me to do, we put that stumbling block in our own path and it hinders God's work in our lives. Please join me in a word of prayer.
Lord, we ask that you would humble us in this. That we would revere you. That we would revere your word. And that you would make us into people who study your scriptures. And who stand before you to give an account in a way that we don't have to be ashamed because we know how to correctly handle your truth and its application toward our own heart and to others. Lord, we need your help in this. We know this is one of the areas that is so difficult to devote ourselves to because this is the last thing our enemy wants us to do is to devote ourselves to you and your word. It's his work to twist it and to keep us from it and to keep us following his lies. But Lord, we ask that we would have abundant life in you through your word. And we ask that you would bless our congregation with a richness of it. That in future generations, you would raise the young who revere your word, believe its inspired power for the next generation. And for the elders that that lead the congregation, that they would study and search the scriptures and be models of behavior in it so that the church will be led rightly. And that in our households that we would speak of it when we rise up and when we walk along the way and when we lie down so our children would know the power of your word and accept you in their hearts because they see Jesus in their parents. God, help us in this to be faithful disciples that we would be disciplined towards godliness in our commitment to your word. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing the, the closing song which speaks of God's word. Key words. It's true. All of it. And truth is powerful when we accept it. Anyone can live a lie and so deceive themselves. But when we search the scriptures and take our creator's advice and his precepts, he sets our path straight. And he makes our life full and rich. A life that is filled with abundance and joy to overflowing no matter what comes your way. It is my sincere prayer that you know this word well. That your discipline in it would cultivate your love for the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would understand his great love for you. That your life would be transformed and that you would be mightily used to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace.